hidden in the very first word of the first verse of the Bible is an encoded message, a word picture, portraying God's plan for the redemption of mankind. A plan that is so extraordinary and so astonishing that it had to be camouflaged and veiled for thousands of years. Because as the Apostle Paul wrote, if the rulers of this world would have known and understood, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. The devils, if they would have known how Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection was going to so upset and wreck their world, they would have never pressed the religious and political powers of their day to crucify Jesus on a cross. But they did crucify him on the cross because the word of God never returns empty or void. It always produces God's will on earth. The Bible tells us that Jesus was slain from the foundation of the cosmos of a world and that you and I were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ before the foundation of the cosmos of the world. In Ephesians, Paul wrote, God has chosen you in him before the foundation of the cosmos world so that you should be holy and without blame before him in love. All of these details and many others were decided on and planned by God before the overthrow of the world. Before Adam sinned in the garden, before the celestial beings rebelled and turned this world into a barren wasteland, before the Nephilim even walked on the earth, the creator of the universe decided on and began to declare his strategy to set everything right and to give every human being an opportunity to repent, to choose God's way, and to turn their life around. You see, God never starts anything without a plan, a plan to begin and a plan to see it through to the end. The fact that you've started your search for God's truth is evidence that he has a plan for your life because Jesus said no one is able to come to him unless the father draws him and gives him the desire to come. No matter how weak or feeble your attempt, you began the journey. And that means the Father has initiated a hunger in your spirit, and He's pulling on you now. He is drawing you into His covenant of blessing because He has a plan and a purpose for your life. That's exactly what He declared in the book of Isaiah. I am God, and there is none other like me. I declare the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Yea, I've spoken it. I will bring it to pass. If I purpose it, I will also do it. Whatever God starts, he completes. If he speaks it, it will be done. I love the words in Philippians 2.13. For it is God who is all the while effectually working in you energizing and creating in you both the desire and the will that inspires you to live in the abundance of his goodness. <laughs> in Jeremiah, he said, I know the thoughts that I think about you, saith the Lord. They're thoughts of peace, shalom, not of evil, to give you an expected end. Shalom in the Hebrew simply means nothing broken, nothing missing, everything restored and made whole. Thoughts of peace and to give you an expected end. The Message Bible says, I know what I'm doing, saith the Lord. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. To plans to give you the future you hope for. You must rest in this truth. God always finishes what he starts. And if he started you, <laughs> he's going to finish you. And he's going to finish you with an expected end. It's not something the devil's going to do screwy in your life. It's what God has planned for your life. Not a scary or ugly outcome because God has a plan for you and there ain't nothing the devil can do about it. And God has a plan for the redemption of all mankind.
And he revealed that plan in the first word of the first verse of Genesis chapter 1. The Hebrew text reads, Bereshit bara Elohim. In the beginning created God. The first word, Bereshit, which we will detail later, means to be the head, the first or the beginning of a series. In other words, before the first day of creation, before the moon or the stars or the planets ever were fashioned, prior to the existence of time, God, Elohim, standing in the dateless past, bara, created the heavens and the earth. The word bara means to cause existence where previously there was none before. It is the aggression from non-entity to entity, the commencement of the existence of a thing. And, and what did God bring into existence for the first time? You can read it from the right to the left, the Hebrew text. Et hashamayim va'et ha'eretz. The essence and substance of the heavens, plural, and the essence of the earth. Notice the little word et, aleph tav. It occurs over 10,000 times in the Old Testament, yet it is rarely ever translated. Ancient commentaries say that et signifies the essence or the substance of a thing. Others write that it represents a particle, the smallest element of physical matter. It represents the prima materia, the first elements of creation from which the present heavens and earth that we know today were later reshaped and reformed, the cosmos we know today. But what I find interesting about that word is the aleph and the tav. These are the first aleph and the last tav letters of the Hebrew alphabet. In the Greek language, that's called the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. God will describe the end from the beginning. And et aleph tav represents that. Everything that's needed to sustain the heavens and the earth throughout the space-time era is contained in those little words. It's the sum and the whole of the Hebrew language. One, at, one rabbi wrote that he had to create the Hebrew words and letters before he could speak the world into existence. He created the Aleph and the Tav and everything in between. And he's now upholding all things by the Aleph and the Tav. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says it. God is upholding and maintaining and guiding and propelling the universe by the mighty word of his power by the Aleph and the Tav. And when did he speak the Aleph and Tav into existence? In the beginning. In the beginning. The first word of the first verse, Bereshit, in the beginning. The letters are Bet, Resh, Aleph, Shin, Yod, and Tav. Each letter is alive and carries within it a portion of the Creator's master plan. The first two letters, Bet and Resh, literally spell out the Aramaic or Chaldean word for sun. It's the word Bar, as in Simon, Bar Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah. The next is the Aleph. Aleph is the first letter of the word El, God. It's Aleph Lameth. It's also the plural, the first letter of the plural, Elohim, Aleph, Lameth, He, Yod, Mem, translated God over 2,000 times. But Aleph is also the first letter of the word Adam and Ish. Both are translated man hundreds of times in the Old Testament. So we could interpret these first three letters as the son of God or the son of man. Let's keep going. The next letter is the letter Shin, which means to perish or to be consumed. However, Shin is also the first letter of the word Shalom. <laughs> shin, Lamed, Va, Mem. Shalom, peace. Nothing missing, nothing broken, everything restored and made whole. 
Next is the letter Yod, which represents a closed or closing hand. It represents a finished work or a deed that's been done or completed. Followed by the letter Tav, the last letter in the alphabet, which stands for a covenant or a sign. And interestingly, in the Paleo-Hebrew, the original Hebrew writing, Tav was written with either an X or a cross. <laughs> you put all this together and you find the secret mystery that God has hidden in the very first word of the Bible. And it says, the Son of God will perish in the finished work of the cross. Or... You could say it means the Son of Man will release shalom, peace to the world, in the finished work of the cross. Shalom, nothing missing, nothing broken, everything whole, everything restored, and everything back in a righteous relationship with the Heavenly Father. That's something to shout about. From the beginning, God described the end. In the book of Titus, the Apostle Paul wrote, the hope of eternal life that we all possess. God promised it to us before the world began. Before the, when was this? Genesis 1.1. In the Greek text, it's pro aeonios chronos, before the eons of chronos time, before time began. The same words are used in 2 Timothy 1.9. Before time began, he planned to give us in Christ, the grace to achieve his purpose. Oh, my Lord. His plan for you and the grace to carry it out on earth was given to you before Adam was even created. <laughs> this is the God that we serve. There is none like him, no one like him. And he sees the end from the beginning. Another thing to point out is the Aramaic, Aramaic phrase, son of man, bar, appears also in Dan Daniel chapter 7. It appears several times throughout the Old Testament. I'm going to only share a few of them with you. In Daniel chapter 7, where in a night vision, the prophet Daniel saw the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, riding in the clouds of heaven, approaching the Ancient of Days. And there was given unto him an everlasting kingdom that shall never pass away. This is the Son of Man, the scripture that Jesus used to designate a title from now on. The book of Revelation begins with the Apostle John heard a great voice declaring, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the Aleph and the Tav. And when John turned to look, he saw the Son of Man. Jesus standing in the midst of golden candlesticks, holding seven stars in his hand. And Jesus said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Hallelujah. The very fact that God hid an Aramaic word in the first verse of the Bible tells me that Jesus sacrificed on the cross was not only for the Jewish nation, but it was also for all the Goyim nations and all the Goyim people of the world. In fact, Jesus' sacrifice is for all the sons of Abraham. And that includes Jews and Christians and Muslims and even non-believers and even the atheists of the world. All can have an impact and enjoy and step into the benefits of Jesus' death and resurrection. Why? John 3.16 says it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life, everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the cosmos to condemn the cosmos, but that the world through him might be saved. But Jesus had to pay a heavy price to purchase your salvation. Matthew's gospel says when he was standing for the last time before Caiaphas, the high priest, that Jesus said out loud, I say unto you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. 
And the high priest got so angry, he began to tear his tunic. And he said, this man has spoken blasphemy. And they began to spit him on his face. They began to hit him and slap him with their hand. And eventually they hung him on the cross, not realizing that what they did was fulfilling God's plan from the beginning. Isaiah 53 tells us what happened to Jesus on the cross. Jesus bore our griefs on the cross, our sickness, our weakness, our distresses, and he carried our sorrows and pains of punishment on the cross. The Message Bible says, but the fact is, it was our pains that he carried on the cross. It was our disfigurement that he bore, all the things that are wrong with us. But he was wounded for our transgressions, Isaiah says. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of your peace, your shalom, was upon him. And with his stripes, you were healed. The previous chapter, Isaiah 52, paints a horrible picture of what Jesus suffered when he was made to be sin and bore the chastisement of your peace and your, your transgressions and your iniquities. It says, for many, the servant of God became an object of horror. Many were astonished at him. His face and his whole appearance were marred more than any man's and his form beyond that of the son of men. Moffat's translation says it this way. Many were appalled at his fate because he was disfigured till he seemed a human man no more. Deformed out of the resemblance of a man. And why did he do this for you, for me? For one reason, because he loves you. So when God hid this mystery in that first word, he knew this was the result, the pain and the suffering. And when Jesus allowed himself to be emptied and to be put into the womb of a woman and be born as a human being and then to suffer the penalty of the cross for you and for me, he knew this from eternity. He knew this is what was going to happen because it's written in the first word of the first verse of the Bible. And why did he do it? For God so loved and dearly prized the world so that he even gave up his only begotten unique son so that whoever believes in, trusts, clings, and relies on Jesus shall not perish, come to destruction, or remain lost anymore. But you'll have eternal life, life as God has it. No one could have imagined what the price that had to be paid to purchase man's redemption. But God did. He imagined it thousands of years ago. And it's in effect in the earth today. But it's not enough for you to know the story. You've got to also believe the story and receive it. You've got to ask Jesus to come into your heart and be the Lord of your life. And say, Lord, I turn from my lifestyle and I repent of my sins. Forgive me and wash me in your blood and teach me how to live an overcoming, blessed life filled with your shalom. Nothing missing, nothing broken, everything restored, everything whole. I release the anointing of God into your life to break all the curse of darkness and to set you free into the presence and the shalom and the life that Jesus purchased for you.